The welcome everyone to our ladies room. We are going to talk about what's new in the tide events. So again, welcome everyone to the third event hosted by uh, the Our Ladies Room chapter. My name is Federica Gazzelloni and I am one of the organizers. I'm thrilled to have you all here tonight. And we are also delighted to be joined by Isabella Velasquez, who will be our esteemed speaker for the evening. Uh, a bit of Italian, so benvenuti. Questo è il terzo evento per questo gruppo Our Ladies Room. Eh, sono Federica Gazzelloni, una delle organizzatrici. Siamo in compagnia di Isabella Velasquez. Ciao Isabella, la nostra relatrice per questa sera. Tutto il materiale verrà condiviso durante la pre presentazione e eh, già lo avete nella chat. Quindi se volete potete dare eh, già un'occhiata eh, anche alla documentazione già diversa di cui parleremo. So what is Our Ladies? Our Ladies uh, starts with Our Ladies Global, which is an organization with the mission of promoting the art language for empowering women at all user level uh, by building a collaborative global network. So it is a gender diversity friendly community, uh, well funded in 2012 by Gabriela Queroz uh, in San Francisco. And our ladies now has grown very, uh, very well. Uh, and it is now a worldwide organization with about 206 chapters and more than 93,000 members globally. So for more information, you can visit ourladies.org. What is Our Ladies Rome? Our Ladies Rome is a local chap chapter of Our Ladies Global, and it is dedicated to promoting gender diversity in the art language community. Uh, our monthly meetings provide a platform to discuss current trends and hot topics in R, and we encourage active participation and engagement from all attendees. So we welcome your suggestions, your comments, and invite you to get in touch to join our vibrant community. Uh, founder is Claudia Vitolo, and she is also a co-founder of Our Ladies Global. I am one of the organizers, and we have a new co-organizer, Katie Wood. And we expect more organizers to join us soon. So this is our poll so far. So we had uh, interesting speakers, and we expect to have more. Uh, we join the next event uh, on April will be uh, a joint event with Our Ladies New York. And we expect Dr. Laura Khan uh, to be presenting her book uh, about One Health and Coronaviruses. And then in May, we have John Arman, which, which is the chief of the R4DS Community Learning, talking about uh, his journey. And then uh, how to get in touch. So you can send an email, uh, find us on Twitter, on GitHub, or on LinkedIn. Uh, the last thing I want to mention uh, is that uh, I've tried uh, a job board. So each month we present um, some some interesting opening. Uh, and for now, this um, so th this month so far has been very interesting. So I've tried putting um, a job uh, opening on LinkedIn for uh, new organizers. And we have 14 enthusiastic responses. So from high qualified individuals who are eager to be part of this new venture. So welcome everyone. I know that you're here as well with all of us. And so we um, have chosen two um, nice co-organizers from because they are basically based in Rome. But we expected to hear, for, uh, hear from you. So if you like to propose anything, please get in touch. So we welcome uh, warmly. So tonight's presentation. So tonight's speaker is Isabella Velasquez, who don't know about her. So for those of you who don't know about her, she is, uh, I use her word, and her enthusiast first learning the programming language during her master in analytics. Previously, Isabella conducted data anal analysis and research, developed infrastructure to support use of data 
and created resources and trainings. Her work on deposit, formerly our studio marketing team, draws on these experiences to create content and supports and strengthen data shine teams. So in her spare time, <laughs> Isabella enjoys playing with her, with her uh, tortoiseshell cat. Watching films, analysis videos. I like to ask more about that, <laughs> Isabella. And hiking in the mountains around Seattle. So you can find that on Twitter and Mastodon at uh, this link. And so in this meetup, we will be learning about what's new in the Tadiverse. So, as, which is a suite of packages that revolutionized data wrangling, visualization, and analysis. And we have a, a Q and A session at the end of the talk, so you can use the chat. Uh, and so we are done. So Isabella, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the introduction, Federica, and, and many thanks to you and our ladies' room for the this opportunity. And thanks all for joining and and listening to what's new in the tidyverse today. I'm very excited to share, um, particularly because there is a lot of exciting news. And so Federica in the chat already um, shared, uh, sorry, trying to get rid of my Zoom toolbar, um, the materials for today. So there's two uh, pieces of resources that might interest you. First up is this website, and I'm going to start off here, but mostly today I'm going to be working in our studio. And the GitHub repository is also available. That's what created this website and has all, all the things that you're going to see me run today. So just kind of to start off, uh, introduction. So again, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Isabella. Um, please keep in touch. I'd love to hear from you. And like I mentioned, there are a lot of really exciting news and updates coming from the Tidyverse team. And it's just absolutely amazing what the Tidyverse team has put out over the past few months. And it's incredible work, both in terms of what they've implemented in the Tidyverse packages, as well as the documentation, the blog posts, all the resources. And so just really wanted to give um, amazing kudos to, to that team for everything that they've done recently. And that being said, there have been a ton of changes recently uh, and we're going to go through some of them today, but I'm going to admit there's no way that we're going to be able to cover everything in full depth. Uh, I also know that there are a few Tidyverse packages that have had updates that we're not going to cover today. For example, 4CATS, dplyr, and dbplyr. Uh, but I did wanna share a few ways that you can stay in the loop with everything that's going on. First off, the uh, R for Data Science second edition is currently in progress. It's available online. You can go look at it while it, uh, it's being written. And I believe the plan is to publish it later this year. Second is the Tidyverse blog. So that was a huge reference for almost everything that you see today. Uh, the team just uh, for major releases or updates uh, periodically posts um, blog posts that kind of walk through all of the changes and I just highly recommend um, you know taking a peek periodically and seeing you know what's new there and uh, there are also really exciting news not just related to the tidyverse for example webr was recently released which is an amazing um, tool for running r in the browser take a look highly worth it really, really recommend it and finally, I also wanted to mention the Posit Glimpse Twitter and Mastodon accounts. And uh, these, this is run by the open source team and sharing like these really cool um, news and, and tools that are coming out and how to use them. Uh, also, you know, a big part of the community sharing like the cool things that, that you all are doing as well. So I um, highly encourage you to follow Posit Glimpse as well. So welcome to this talk. I am assuming that you may have some familiarity with the Tidyverse. If you don't, what the Tidyverse is, it's an opinionated collection of R packages uh, that are designed for data science. And so things like from uh, data import to data wrangling to data visualization, et cetera, that is um, encompassed in the Tidyverse packages. If you ever wanna see what all the packages are, the Tidyverse has a very handy function to do so, which is listed here. 
And another thing I wanted to note about this website, it is built on a tool called Quarto, uh, which lets you create uh, documents in all different kinds of um, uh, formats like HTML like this or PDF or, or et cetera. And um, it also can run uh, code. So R, Python, um, all natively. And so also a very cool tool. And if you hover over links on this website, there are actually URLs and you can open them up and see the reference for those functions. So if you're going through and you're like, oh no, I, I really need to learn more about reframe, uh, you can just click that function name and, and open it up. So another thing I wanted to mention is uh, PAC. PAC is a mod modern successor to uh, packages like DevTools and remotes if you have used those before. And you can install all of the newest version of the packages that we're going to talk about today using PAC. In addition, in the post, you're going to see I use PAC to download the very specific versions of the packages that we're talking about. Um, the reason is this is being recorded. I don't know when you're going to be watching this. And so very likely things have changed. And um, using PAC lets you ensure that you're using exactly the version that I'm talking about when I talk about these functions and arguments and things like that. Really briefly, I wanted to cover the lifestyle stages. So this uh, is uh, could reference functions, arguments, packages, um, et cetera. But usually it's in reference to functions, uh, the stage in which the function exists. And so there's these four stages. And so the first one is stable. Uh, this is the default. What stable means is the author is happy with the pa uh, function and it's not likely to change anytime soon. Another one is deprecated. So deprecated means uh, that it is um, it not to be used anymore and uh, it, there is an alternative that's a better um, function for you as opposed to the one that you're looking at. The other um, term is superseded. So what this means is the function isn't going to go away like it would be if it were deprecated, but uh, there are alternatives um, that you should consider instead. And finally, there's experimental, which means this function is uh, something that you can go try out, give feedback on, but there's no guarantee that it's, it's going to stick around long term. So for example, this is a function called recode. you're going to see up here a badge that lets you know that it's been superseded. Uh, and we're gonna talk about what supersedes recode later on. Another quick note that I wanted to mention um, is vectors. So this is a package that kind of works behind the scenes of a lot of the tidyverse things that you see. And a lot of these updates recently have been rewritten to use this vectors package, which kind of like, standardizes and brings all the rules together in one place. And so as you know, if you're a data scientist or a data analyst, this isn't going to impact you too much. Just generally know that it means better error messages, more consistency and bug fixes. And another thing is the, the hope is that um, the reliance on vectors kind of encourages higher quality code. So to give an example, this is something that you could create with if else. Um, where you have a vector one through 10 and then an NA. The if else statement says, you know, if it's uh, divisible by two, then return X. And then if not, uh, X in character as a character value. And so before this might have, you know, kind of uh, gone by okay. Like um, it, R would kind of assume like what you were trying to do. But now with vectors, it's going to give you an error. And it's going to tell you why you can't combine true, oh, sorry, integer and character um, values. And the reason for that is it's kind of assuming like that you may be making a mistake. And if you're not making a mistake, it's just going to ask you to be more explicit about what exactly that you're doing. So again, it's um, encouraging like higher quality by being more explicit. And again, that's a theme that we're going to just see throughout. And the final note before we get started is you're going to see a lot of the base R pipe instead of the Magritte R pipe. Uh, so the base R pipe, it looks like um, a slash and then a greater than sign. 
versus the mercury radar pipe, which is uh, the percentage, the greater than percentage sign. And uh, we're going to be using the base R pipe because first of all, that's what the Tidyverse team is using. So you're going to see the second edition of R for data science. That's what they've been using in all of the blog posts. That's what they've been using. Um, it is similar, but not the same as the Magritte R pipe. If you have any questions, uh, I actually wrote a blog post along with my brother on how to understand the base R pipe. And so I linked it here uh, in case it is useful for you. Um, I hope so. And it was also a lot of fun to write together. And then uh, I also linked uh, to the note in R for data science, which kind of talks about why you would use, why the team is using the base R pipe instead of Magritte R pipe. So thank you. That's just a quick intro because I wanted to kind of give a foundation on how I'm going to be referring things to things. Like if I mentioned vectors, I want you to, you know, um, understand what exactly I'm talking about. And uh, another thing is there are a lot of packages one, one more time that have been updated. So what I'm thinking of doing is going through the packages and after I cover all the material that I have for that particular package, then opening it up for questions on that before moving on. Um, so uh, please put them in the chat and I will um, get back to them as soon as I'm done with that particular package. Okay. So like I mentioned, I'm going to be moving uh, to my R studio now. So first up, we're going to be talking about Tidyverse. Uh, Tidyverse just had a new release. 2.0.0 uh, is now out. And like I mentioned, you can install a specific version of a package using pack like so, and that's what I already have. And then you load the package as usual with library. Okay. So you, if you are a user of the Tidyverse, you may have seen this many, many times. Take a look. Does anything look different? Okay. Ta-da! The package Lubridate is now part of the core Tidyverse. You can see that within here. Uh, it's listed here. And this is very exciting news. So what that means is when you load library tidyverse, it uh, Lubridate automatically attaches to your session. You don't have to call it separately, which is something very common that people had to do. Library tidyverse, library Lubridate. Now uh, you don't need to do that. Um, and that, you know, very exciting news for anybody who uses Lubridate, uh, which is a package for working with dates and times and has very, very nice functions for, for doing so. <laughs> and then the second thing that you may have noticed is this message that says, use the conflicted package to force all conflicts to become errors. So with this new version of Tidyverse, the conflicted package is being advertised. So what a conflict means is that uh, two packages or two or more packages have functions of the same name. And in R, the default uh, way that it deals with this is that the second or the package loaded last wins and that uh, package's function overrides the other package's function. So for example, if you were loading uh, dplyr and mass, they both have this function called select. And if you were to do this, Actually, it does give you a message <laughs> letting you know select is masked from dplyr, but um, I don't know about you. Sometimes I kind of glaze over <laughs> the messages that it gives me. And so if you you know happen to forget or you didn't read it later on, uh, whenever you are using select, you might become very frustrated because you're trying to run you know a pipe and for some reason it's just not selecting your columns and it's very frustrating. And so how is you know how is your R session supposed to know which one it is that you um, that you want? And so by loading conflicted beforehand, if you have packages that have conflicts, select will give you an error. Or, sorry, loading that um, function will give you an error. So a conflicted will be very specific. It will let you know it's been found in two packages and give you two options for dealing with this. The first option is that you can identify the namespace or identify the package 
that you're referring to every time that you're using that function. So for select, I'm saying I always want to be, or I want to be using deep higher select. And then later on, I could be using masses select. Or another option is to declare a preference with conflicts prefer. And by doing that, it's saying that uh, anytime it sees select, it will prefer deploy or select uh, unless you tell it otherwise. And so uh, Conflicted is a very handy package. I like cannot believe how many times select and filter have <laughs> gotten me, you know, in, in my data analysis workflows. And so it's just something um, the Tidyverse team recommends that you use. Another note is at the bottom of all of these posts, I'm going to be linking to um, the blog post that I am referencing, as well as the release notes and any other resources that I have found. Um, hopefully, again, that is helpful for you as you continue, you know, learning about what's new in the tidyverse. Okay, before I move on to Deepire, any questions about the tidyverse update? Not Libre date conflicted package. Okay, so DeepHire um, 1.1.10 uh, has been released and it has a bunch of new um, functions and, and things that you can do. And uh, again, just highly recommend looking at everything. It's, it's incredible. Um, and the first thing that we're going to be talking about is what is called the per operation grouping. So this is something new. So let's go through it. As usual, you can install the package that you'd like, and I'm going to load it here. So per operation grouping is something experimental that's going on. Instead of group by, you have the option of using by for your uh, for grouping in, in pipes. So let's cover what group by is again. Uh, it is a function that lets you group by one or more variable. So say you have this table of transactions. You have a company, A and B, and you have year, and you have revenue for that year. Uh, and you notice like there are some years that uh, have duplicate uh, rows for the revenue. So a very common thing that you may be asked is how do you get revenue by company and year, the total revenue by company and year. And so very commonly you will take the data frame transactions, you're going to group by company and year, and you're going to mutate uh, total equals the sum of that revenue. Oops, and I should. Um, so taking a look here, what you have done is uh, created a total column, and for uh, company A in this year 2019, it it will have both of the rows, but it will have some the 20 and the 50 from that year and that company into the total. Um, column. And so that's great. That works and gives you what you need. But you may notice up here, there's this message that says groups, company, and year. And so the reason for that is group by is what is called persistent grouping. It lasts for more than one operation. And just because you have created this column and done what you want it to do doesn't mean that the groups have gone away. So another option um, that you may have thought of is uh, you could use summarize. So summarize is another function from dplyr, and you can uh, take the transactions, group by, and then um, summarize. And as you notice here, the difference between this and what we did above is uh, this is A2019. I'm sorry that it's not showing all the way, um, that you have one row. Uh, for each group of company and year, as opposed to multiple like we did up here. And that's what uh, Summarize does. It, it gives you um, a, a result of one for each group. And if you notice here, the groups, it just says company. So year is has been peeled off the group, um, which you know is good if you know. But if you don't know, it might be very confusing as you try to do further operations and um, you know, you're like, why, why are things not grouping or summing the correct way? So what if you just didn't want groups anymore? And you had a couple of options. Uh, the first one is that you could do ungroup. So uh, group by your operation, ungroup, and doing so means that you no longer have any groups um, there. 
The second option is within your summarized statement to say groups equal drop. So saying uh, summarize this and then drop the groups. And so in both of these cases, you can see that there's no longer group listed uh, in your output. And now there is a new by, an, um, uh, the by idea. So this is the per operation grouping. And what that means is you do, your, you take your frame or data frame, you do your thing, you get back a bare data frame. Uh, I also like group by um, those ones that have groups still, even after you do your operation are called group data frames. By doesn't do that. It's, it's a bare data frame your operation, a bare data frame. And so the way that it works is your by statement is in line with the uh, operation that you want to run. And so in this case, we want to create a total column with mutate that sums the revenue. And we're saying do it by company and year, just directly in the line. And doing that, it gives you uh, that original output that we were looking for, but now we don't have a grouped uh, data frame which is very, very handy. Um, so that means it's no longer grouped on the way out. It does the one operation and then it drops off. And this makes more sense on the website, but essentially it's reiterating what I just said before. It was a bare TIVL transaction and then you ended up with a group data frame and now it's bare TIVL uh, or data frame and transaction and then bare TIVL or data frame. Uh, this has several advantages. Um, again, you didn't see that message about regrouping. Um, you never have to remember to ungroup again, <laughs> which is pretty sweet if you've uh, ever encountered that before. Another thing is that order doesn't matter. If you uh, remember with the summarize, company stayed, year was the one that was peeled off, and that's because year was the second group. Um, in this case, uh, it doesn't matter whether you have company or if you have year. Um, it, it, because you're doing it line by line, as opposed to kind of like all together. Another thing is, um, you know, you might consider this easier to read because again, you're associating exactly what you're grouping by with the operation. And another advantage is you can use tidy select, which uh, things like all of, um, you know, contains and things like that, you can do that within your by uh, operation which is um, you know, very handy if, if that's something that you need. But there are some caveats. Uh, by is only for selection, so it doesn't uh, create columns, which is something that you can do with group by. It always re returns an ungrouped or a bare data frame. And so in your previous code, you may have uh, used group by depending on that group data frame. So it's just something to note if you intend to you know, switch out your code or anything like that. Um, again, you have to create those columns ahead of time because by is not going to actually create columns for you. So they need to already exist. And uh, there's also the, the question of sorting. So um, group by sorts by ascending order and that impacts the results. By does not, so just something else to be aware of. Just a quick note that this was inspired by data table, which is another package for data manipulation. Um, the Tinyverse team saw that they had, uh, you know, kind of implemented this per operation grouping and, you know, thought like, what about, uh, what about for dplyr? So that's kind of the summary. Um, there's various uh, dplyr verbs that are supported by by. So here's the list here and there's more information in the documentation. And you might be wondering, is, is there a period or not <laughs> in by? I, I, everywhere I try to put by slash by. Um, and this is depends on the function that you're using. It's just a, a thing about dplyr. Some use the period, some don't. And so if you try to do it with uh, the incorrect one, it will just give you an error. And it's very informative. It's just going to let you know that you need to use by without a period instead here. So running that gives you what you need. And so then you can continue forward. And you may be wondering, what about group by? Um, it is not going away. It's not fabricated. It's, uh, it's not superseded. And there's no pressure to use by or by only if it makes sense to you. Uh, OK, I see that some uh, questions in the chat. 
Would you like to answer? Okay. Uh, now for, for this um, uh, part of the uh, package, yeah. So it says within the same format, is, uh, is it possible to not have revenue while summarizing and directly have unique rows like it used to be grouped by? Um, yeah. Sorry, do you, uh, Deja, is it okay if I reach out to you afterwards? I want to make sure that I understand your question correctly. Okay, let, let, let's read the yeah, other thank you. Yeah. Um, how are in group operations on already group tables? Uh, so how they, uh, the, the group operation on uh, are handled? Do we get original groups after the operation? Uh, oh, that is yeah. great question. I actually have not tried to see what happens if you use by with um uh in a group let's see what happens if we try it um i think the assumption is you're using one or the other you're either using group by or you're using um by by but let's see so we have transactions uh, this one is grouped transactions group save it into and live coding is always a little dangerous, so please bear with me if it doesn't work. Um, so the question is like, can you do, oh, I still use the new reader pipe. <laughs> uh, so something like summarize. Mm. would be another thing to summarize by. Um, so just like revenue uh, by equals like so. Okay. Okay, I think it looks like it it retains the original group, um, but it's a great question. Uh, I'll dig in a bit deeper, but um, I, I I think another point with by is that it is like one of those examples of something that make you be a little bit more explicit. Um, in that, like you know, if you want to keep company and year you have to write company and year and so uh yeah i think it's like learning about your your workflows and, and things like that but um yeah I'm, that's a good question i hadn't thought about that okay. uh, uh, i don't see other questions but i am i have one uh about the dot buy option mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You, okay, uh, actually, uh, two questions about that. So you, mm -hmm. you, you can use that uh, um, um, what, so as a group by, okay? So, and you use it inside the mutate function. What mm -hmm. I, I, I um, want to, so you said that I cannot create columns, but so with mutate, I create columns when I make modification. It's, it's like but I'm not able to create new columns or just the name of the columns. The yeah. I believe that's referring to that. Um, like this does create a new column. Well, but like you, I believe like here, these have to already exist. Okay. Okay. So those, so those one that you use for grouping. Right. And my, my question is, can, can I do more than one, uh, like, vector, uh, summarizing vector? That's yes, fine. and uh, but the idea is, again, like, you do it, uh, like, one operation for each by. So you would pipe it and create a new operation and then specify the groups for that operation there. 
So you kind of like layer on um, all the things that you want to do. And w one more. So the, the mm -hmm. last thing, um, it belongs to a particular type of functions or just some have uh, required it and others not? Uh, the dot? Yeah. Yeah, so it depends on the verb, the defier verb that you're using. Um, if if you're using, for example, size max, it seems like it requires one without a dot. And so what you would do if you use the incorrect one, it, it will give you an error. Um, but here in the information, it's going to tell you why you got an error and what to do instead. So in this case, it says, did you mean to use by without a period? And so you can rerun it like so. And you'll see that that works. Yeah. So that's great. So I just realized that you are using, just, just realized that you are using this uh, by grouping, this by or grouping inside different functions. So. I, right. Yeah. So just realize that, that I, I was thinking about mutate and now, yes, of course, it, it, you, you need to the, use the dot, for example, with slice. So what is this? Uh, has been implemented for all functions or ser a certain type of functions that yes yeah. okay right yes <laughs> yeah yeah so uh, for certain verbs so you can see them here um, again the the whether or not you use the dot depends on the function but uh, these are the ones that are supported by by okay. Okay. thank you yeah of course thank you everyone. great questions and if I can't answer anything, I will find out and I will update the documentation. Um, and hopefully it can serve as a good resource too. So thank you. Awesome. So another DPIR uh, addition or changes is pick, reframe, and arrange. And so I'm going to refresh my R session to make sure. I don't have any output. Okay. Awesome. So again, oh, why is this still here? I'm using my personal laptop, so please bear with it. It's a little old. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that's okay. So I'm going to load dplyr. I think I may have overloaded my computer. There we go. <laughs> OK, there we go. Uh, load dplyr. So while that is loading. So across is an operator that you could do for, um, for applying functions across columns. And so it's, it's very commonly used for that. But it turns out that you can actually use it for column selection uh, instead. And so um, I, the developers had noticed that this was something that was happening. So if you have this data frame, right? Um, so it has all these things and you want uh, the, the number of columns that start with X, the number of columns that start with Y, and you put it within summarize. If you notice, you're using a cross within summarize, and it does work. It gives you, you know, the two columns have x, one column have y. Uh, but the issue is <laughs> that that's actually not what a cross was um, originally implemented for. It was for for functions, and so, uh, but that's okay. Not all hope is lost. Uh, Dplyr one point one point zero has a new function specifically for this and it's called pick. So if you run that, it will give you exactly what you expected uh, up above. Uh, so it's just an alternative, um, uh, well, it, it's a better option because it is a function that's meant to do what you expect it to do. So if you have been using a cross in functions like um, mutate or summarize, uh, use pick instead. And they mentioned that it still works, across still works in, in these functions for now, but it's going to be deprecated.
reframe um, is something that has been implemented because of what the developers had been noticing in terms of how people use these different functions. And so in dplyr 1.0.0, summarize could return uh, per group length of any length. And that was different from before. Before it had to be in length one, if you got a zero or anything more than one, throw an error. So for example, here you have a table, maybe df, you have, um, I'm sorry, a vector called table, <laughs> a df, a tibble, and then um, say you wanted to intersect uh, this df with table, and then by G. So it's referring to G as the group and using the by operator, which we just uh, covered, and then um, returning the intersection. And if you run this, you, you will notice that G, the group, has multiple results per group. Um, and again, this is something that, that uh, started in dplyr 1.0.0, but it uh, raised a lot of concerns. Um, First of all, it increased the chances for bugs. Um, the idea behind the summary is one row per group, not multiple. And so it's like, oh, why can summarize do this now? And for folks who use dbplyr, it made translation very difficult. And so this feature has now been walked back. So that means if you summarize and get uh, zero or more than one row per group, you will get um, a warning. But again, uh, there is an alternative. So if this is something that you intend and you want to do, there is the function called reframe. And so um, again, it's just do something for each group it, as opposed to using um, summarize like we did above. We use reframe, which is a function that's, that's meant for this purpose. So again, um, uh, something to note is reframe will always give an ungrouped data frame. Uh, and so even if the input was grouped, so it will ungroup them. And again, another habit to kind of pick up and, and carry forward as, you know, as these functions get, uh, um, really it's like, it's just helpful to start learning like the new things that are coming out. And then finally, I wanted um, to mention a range. So this one isn't a replacement. Uh, a range has existed before. Uh, but a difference is that it's now using what's called the C locale instead of the system locale for sorting vectors. And essentially what that means, it just makes dplyr 1.1.0 like a lot faster than before. So uh, here it's a 500,000 random strings that I'm created, creating in DF. You can look at it here. And so in the previous locale uh, from before, let's see how long it takes to sort this. OK, that took nine seconds. <laughs> so quite a bit of time. And let's see with the new locale from the newest version of, of dplyr. That took 1.27. So you can see that there's significant difference in terms of the speed of sorting. Um, if you want to use the old uh, locale, there is this option with, with R. Um, however, it's going to be removed at some point, just be aware. Or if you want to be explicit with another locale, you can mention it uh, as an argument here. So it's not that you have to use the C locale at all. Again, very, very much, much faster. Um, but there is something to be aware. It, it slightly changes how vectors are sorted. Um, to be honest, I'm not 100% sure the, the details behind that. But if it is something that could impact you, just be aware that, it, that that's the case. OK, so that was uh, pick, reframe, and arrange. All right, let's talk about case one, case match, and consecutive ID also changes in uh, dplyr. Told you there's a lot. <laughs> um, let's load our package. So if you uh, have ever used case one, you're in good company. If you feel like it's a very popular function for generalized um, if-else statements. Yeah. And so I have a few changes to case one. So. I don't know how long you have been using R, 
but I remember a time when I could run this and not get an error. Um, and then at some point things changed and all of a sudden I started getting this error. NA must be character, not logical. So uh, from one day to the next, had to know what, what kind of NA I needed uh, for my case one statement. Oh, and I'm sorry, and just a quick uh, overview of how case one works. You say case one, um, here is a vector of numbers. It's saying when X is greater than or, uh, or equal to 10, call it large. When it's greater than or equal to zero, it's small. When it's less than zero, it's an NA. And so, um, yeah, again, in the good old times, you didn't have to say NA uh, character, which would like this. And so I think, yeah. Um, however, now, thanks to vectors, the, the package that I mentioned before, uh, you no longer have to specify the type of NA. Very, very exciting. <laughs> um, so now when you do this, it just works and no error thrown. So that's one really big change. Um, if you're like me, <laughs> I could never remember the different NAs. Uh, the second change is uh, before, if you wanted to set a default in case one, you have to do this. Uh, so you say large, small, missing, and then for everything else, make it uh, like true, squiggle, other. Why? I don't know. I actually remember the day my coworker taught me this, and I was like, why is it true? And he was like, I don't know. But that's, you know, the way that you set defaults in uh, case one. And so in this case, uh, negative one, which doesn't, which is not greater than or equal to 10, not greater than or equal to zero, and not an A would fall under other, um, which is here. And so, um, yeah, so this syntax is really odd. It was very different from anything I had seen before and kind of hard to remember too. But now with uh, the new version of dplyr, there's an explicit argument called default. So it makes it much easier to read, uh, much easier to remember what exactly you need. So you do dot default with um, the thing that you want for everything else that doesn't fit your, your logical statements. You run it and uh, yeah. And so it's just uh, another um, you know, way that, that dplyr has improved the way that we work with uh, data. It's true it's not deprecated yet, but it, it will be in the future. So also another thing to kind of just start picking up and, and using in your workflow. Okay, so if you've all, uh, ever used case one, there are times that it can be a bit repetitive. So here we have a vector of countries. We have USA and Canada, UK, China, Mexico, Russia. And we want whenever, um, whenever uh, the value is in USA, Canada, Mexico, we want it to be North America. Whenever it's Wales or UK, we want to replace it with Europe. And whenever it's China, we want to replace it with Asia. I probably need to save that. Ta-da. Um, so very handy, like uh, much better alternative than using a bunch of nested if else statements, but it is uh, a little still a little repetitive. So with the new version of dplyr, there's a special case that lets you do this without having to rewrite stuff all the time. So now you give it, you know, what it is that you want to replace. And instead of having to note in every single time, you could just say, like, this is what I want to replace it by. Doom, doom, doom. So again, it's really just a nice uh, special case alternative for you know streamlining your code. And so uh, before you may have noticed for NAs, we had to say is NA for the value. Now you can just list NA like this and say what you want to replace it by. And then it also works with default, which we just covered instead of true. And just a thing to note, if owls has the same updates as case one. Uh, so. All right. And last thing in uh, this document is consecutive ID. And so, uh, Highly recommend reading Davis Vaughn's um, blog post. The, the example that he gave is quite fun, um, but I just created an, another short little one if, um, for today. 
so this is friends dialogue and so uh, here we have uh, the text the thing that was said and then here we have who who spoke and uh, uh, funny fact monica is the first person to speak in friends and if you notice in the dialogue there's sometimes where you know it switches from monica to joy to chandler but then phoebe speaks two times and but the transcript is kind of broken up into two different rows and so there might be a case where you want uh, what she said to be together in one line. And so if you um, try to do that in R, you can try to use uh, summarize, right, to put the groups together and use the string R function called string flatten to kind of collapse the data into consecutive uh, dialogue. But if we do that, we see um, we we went too far. Uh, originally, we had 10 lines of dialogue. Now we only have four lines. And that's because for everything in Monica, it grouped it together and put it in one line. Uh, for everything for Joey, everything for Chandler, and everything for Phoebe. And so that means um, that the transcript is now out of order and, and not exactly what we want. And so the dplyr new version has something that can help with this, and it's called consecutive ID. So you create a new ID that provides you the consecutive ID. And you can see here now, Monica spoke first, so she's one. Uh, Joey is two, Chandler is three. Phoebe spoke twice in a row, and since uh, it's the same person, it will assign the same ID uh, for any consecutive series of, of uh, the group. And same, similarly, Monica five, and then Chandler six, six, six. And so now that we have this ID, we can use that in our summarized statement um, to group the dialogue correctly. And now we have um, the correct order of consecutive dialogue for each of the characters. Okay, that was case one, case match and consecutive ID. Uh, there is a question. Can you use regex in case match? I, I believe so. Anything, I believe anything you could do in case one, you could do in case match, but I will double check. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to talk about a new function. I would like to clear my output. I'm sorry if it takes a little while. Um, so string R is a package that uh, makes it really easy to work with string. It has a ton of functions that, you know, help you find repeated values, pull out the first character, pull out the last three characters, etc. And so in um, Three years. Uh, it, it's just got its first release uh, since three years ago. And so it has accumulated a lot of functions that are now officially part of, um, of string R. So let's load it. Uh, the first one, and probably um, the, the biggest like change, is this uh, function called string view. And so it lets you see a character with special strings. And so you might have something like this uh, with a lot of dash ends. And when you print it out, it looks exactly like that. <laughs> but that's not very informative because that's not actually what it looks like. And in base R, there is a function called write lines that lets you take a good look at it. And so here we can see uh, the dash n is new sp um, the new line. And so they're actually on three separate lines, a, the, the colon, or not the colon, sorry, the dash, and then the quotation mark and the C. And so in the new version of string R, there's string view. So that is something new. And there you can see very clearly what exactly that string looks like. So very, very handy, um, especially if you're working with, with stuff like that looks like that. <laughs> um, and so another thing is it highlights special characters. So in this case, this is uh, a special kind of space. 
So when you print it, it looks normal though. It looks like a regular space that you've seen anywhere. But if you try to do an equality of that and one with a regular space, you'll see that it's not actually um, the same. But with string view, it provides really nice highlighting um, and, and functionality to really clearly point out um, those kind of special characters. Similarly for, with tabs, if you've ever run into something that had a tab that you couldn't see, uh, now string view lets you see, lets you, you know, find that very easily. And if it also makes matches really stand out. Um, you know, if you're ever double checking your work and making sure that you caught everything that you expected to catch. So here we have A, B, C, D, E, F, F, G, uh, H, I, and we want to single out every time we see A, E, I, O, U. With string view, uh, it has like, again, that nice color highlighting, it puts it in the, um, uh, the greater than and lesser than sign. So it's really easy to see, oh, here's the A, here's the E, here's the I. This is regex for um, the last character in a string. So again, and just another example of how string view shows you exactly what you're looking for. And then finally, um, uh, this is regex for anything that that is like a duplicate. And here we go. So pointing out the PP, the LL, the RR, et cetera. That is string view. And like I mentioned, uh, string R, the new version, has just a ton of uh, different functions that may be helpful for you. There's string equal, which tells you if two strings are the same. Um, you can ignore case if you want. This one is another string equal. So these are um, A with an accent, but they're just encoded in two different ways, but they are equivalent. And so uh, this is what it looks like. If you do, you know, A1 equals to A2, it's going to say false. Um, but since it's the same character, but just a different encoding string equal will let you know that they're actually true. Another one is string rank. So it'll give you the rank of the values. So in this case, uh, it will assign one to A, two to B, and then four to C because there's two Bs. String unique, as you can imagine, it returns any unique values. And you can also ignore case in this And another function um, before, if you wanted uh, to split a single string and return a character vector, you needed to um, do string split and then unlist because it would re always return a list. Uh, but now with the new version of string R, there's a function called string split one, and it will do all of that in one go. Like that. So it's splitting by the, by the dash. Um, and gives you a character vector. And finally, um, I guess, I, yeah, <laughs> is a string split I. And so what this does is uh, it will extract a specific piece of a string that you that you tell it to. So we have this string, we say split it by the dash and give me the second um, output or the second value and then as you can imagine, this is going to give you B, it's going to give you E, and then it's going to give you G because that's the second of this string after it's been split. Uh, if you give it something that doesn't exist, it will output an, an A because A, B, C only has uh, four after it's, or three after it's been split. So it's going to return in an A. And you can also do for the last value by using a negative number in string split i. Oh yes, and I this is a string like, which is like string detect um, for anybody that uses SQL and wants to use like a similar syntax, just need to add a heading to it. And that's a string r. Any questions? Uh, I don't see questions in the chat. Okay. But um, 
So I really like this uh, string string uh, things that release um, elements already unlisted. So I will ask for okay. that. that. That's very useful. Because you know you do grouping and things, and then you want to use the the vector that you have yeah. um, extrapolated for uh, you know extracting some. Uh, strings that correspond to the, the vector that you have just created and everything. And then you need to unlist and then, uh, yeah. yeah, so that is very useful. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I think like these functions are going to be very helpful. Like I work a lot with text data and like, you know, it comes in all different formats, all sorts of like hidden stuff. Um, it'll be very helpful to see, you know, <laughs> where they are uh, before, you know, running something and, and having it be incorrect. <laughs> um, cool. All right. Thanks, all. So uh, now we're going to move on to TidyR, uh, which also has several new changes. It's TidyR 1.3.0. It has a few new separate functions. And, oh, that's why it looks like that going to move to my visual editor. All right. All right, so I've loaded TidyR. So um, there are, there were several ways of separating um, with TidyR that had like a lot of different ways of, of, or, you know, the, it wasn't very standardized. So for example, if you wanted to separate with a delimiter, like comma or colon or whatnot, um, for columns that you would use separate and then you would say the delimiter in step. Or you, for rows, you would use separate rows. For separate by position, you would use this, like similar to that, but then there was no equivalent for make rows. And for regular expressions, there was extract, uh, but only for columns. And so, uh, in the 1.3.0 release of tidy R, now there's a new separate family of functions that supersede all of these. Um, and so uh, that means there are better alternatives for you out there. What those are and how they look like is separate um, wider uh, and then by what you want to separate by um, and separate longer by what you want to separate by. So now if you want to separate with the limiter, you would use, if for a column, you would use separate wider the limb for a row, separate longer the limb. And um, as you can imagine for position, uh, for column separate wider precision with regular expression, separate wider regex. And then for uh, rows and position, there's separate longer precision. Um, so they are uh, longer, but I think, um, you know, when doing this presentation, it just made so much more sense <laughs> when I was like, oh, I want to do it by this now. Um, it was a lot easier to just switch out the limb to position to regex as opposed to trying to remember, you know, is it uh, an argument or is it, a, you know, a whole different uh, function. So uh, that is what's new in TidyR, um, the new separate family of functions. And so I created a Pulled this data from the tidy high dot package from our open side and it provides a bunch of real-time data um, on canadian uh, stations water stations and so once we load it i'm going to pull some data and i'm going to show you what the date looks like or the date column just give a second okay so now we have a column called date um, but as you can see, it's kind of all uh, pushed together, the, the um, year, month, day, the hour, minute, second. And there are different ways of doing this, but for the purpose of this demonstration, we're going to use tidy R. So say that we want to separate the date and the time um, into their own separate rows. We can use separate wider position um, if, if we choose to. So uh, because the date is like, you know, the same length throughout and the hour, minute, second is the same date throughout. Let's just see how to do it with a separate wider position. So with the function, we're going to say, um, we're going to select that column and then we're going to say uh, year, month, date, create a column called year, month, date that's 10 
characters long. Um, another column that's called space, it's one, and hour, uh, minute, second, that's eight characters long. So doing that gives us uh, what we expect. Now um, the date is it's in its own column, the space is in its own column, and then hour, minute, second in its own column. But you may be wondering, like, we don't really need this column. <laughs> like, you know, can we do it without um, putting that out there? And the answer is yes. But uh, how do you do it? So say you were to run something like this, where you just try to ignore it and just don't mention the space at all. Um, you just try to pull out 10 characters for the day, the year, month, day, and eight characters for the hour, minute, second. Not expecting that. Let me go back to my source and see if something has happened. Okay. Um, well, yes. So if you try to do something that is um, too few or too many of whatever it is that you need to do, it will give you an error, but not just that, it will tell you what exactly happened. So in this case, um, this ex this is expecting, uh, sorry, the number of characters in all of this is 19, but we only gave it 18, right? We only gave it 10 and eight. So it was expecting 18, but it got 19. So in this case, it is what is called, um, you can start using these debugging features that are now part of tidy R uh, 1.3.0 to kind of figure out like what exactly happened. And so uh, it will even tell you, use this to diagnose a problem, use this to silence a problem. And so let's uh, try and debug. We're going to use too many equals debug. And so rerunning that. Uh, added here, right? It will provide these really informative columns that will tell you what exactly happened. So here is date. Uh, date is 19 characters long. Um, is it okay? No. And it tells you which rows failed. Um, and all of this is pretty uniform, but you can imagine if, if they're not uniform, it would be very helpful to kind of pinpoint like, oh, this one failed because maybe there's an extra space somewhere or something like that. Um, so now we know the problem it happened with <laughs> every single row in this uh, in this instance, and uh, we need to fix it. And because we gave it eighteen, it's actually nineteen. Um, but the tidy R does have a way of um, of emitting output that you don't want or components that you don't want. So what you do is just uh, don't assign it to anything. So in this case, we do um, year, month, day plus 10, and then one, which signifies the space that we don't want, and then hour, minute, second equals eight. And doing that, we have the right um, number of characters, which is 19. And then when we do it, we get only the two columns that we were actually interested in. And uh, as another example, if you wanted to do it with the limb instead of position, or wanted to continue this with the limb instead of position, um, here the year, uh, month, day are separated by dashes. Here they're separated by uh, hour, minute, seconds are separated by column, columns. And so you can um, use separate wider the limb and specify you know, the different the limbs like so. Um, as you can see, it's very uniform. Um, very easy to remember. And then you get uh, exactly um, what you would expect if you separate it out by dashes and by columns. And then finally, to give an example of separate wider regex, uh, so we're going to load the tidy census package, which is an amazing package that makes it very easy to pull data from the census. And so if you look at, okay, uh, it takes a second because it's pulling a lot of data. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, so we can see here. Oh, I'm sorry. First, let's look at. So we have um, a data frame and under name, it has uh, like the block, the block group, the census uh, tract, you know, everything like mushed together with, um, with uh, commas as well. And you can imagine there are also various different ways of splitting this out, but say, you know, we're only interested in the block numbers, uh, the block group numbers, and census tract numbers, everything else. Like, we really don't need the block. You can use regex to specify, um, you know, only give me the numbers, and then put that within separate wider regex uh, to you know, get the, the output that we want. So in this case, we're saying, you know, look at name within, um, within name, uh, pull out the number associated with the block. It, it'll be whatever is block and then the space and then whatever is between that and the comma. And so then similarly with block group and with uh, census tract. And then it also has regex for county and state uh, to get stuff uh, to, like to not capture the comma. So anyway, yeah, lots of regex statements uh, within separate wider regex to get you exactly what you need and just like simplifies the workflow, like rather than having to have multiple steps for um, data manipulation, just being able to do it all at once. And so here we have the output where for block, we just have the number for block group, we just have the number um, and no commas, no, no characters or anything like that. So that's tidy R. Uh -huh. Any questions? Oh, I guess that's not tidy R. So it's new separate functions are still a bit more on tidy R. Okay. So in tidy R, there's uh, some improvements to unnest wider and unnest longer. So I'm just gonna load it again. So uh, in the spirit of a lot of what we've mentioned so far, um, if you have something, so um, here's a, a nested list. So in the first ID, it contains A and B. In the second ID, it contains D, E, F. And uh, it will be more explicit with errors if there is one. So you're trying to um, unnest wider here, and it's going to say, a, you can't unless elements with missing names. Can you please use set, uh, name step to create some names? So really nice, really informative. Um, and so you can fix it by doing so. And by specifying name step, but then you can see that it's all been unnested here. I don't know why it's all squished though. Well, apologies. Uh, and on the website, it should show up a, a bit better. And there is a function called um, uh, unnest. There, I'm sorry. Uh, there's an argument called keep empty in unnest that lets you uh, keep values. And essentially, um, now unnest longer has also has a keep empty. So before, it used to like here we have um, a nested data frame with one to three as ID, and then within one that was null. So when you, uh, oops, sorry, oh yes, uh, this was a one is null, two is a blank, um, an empty integer, and then three has one through three. When you did a nest longer it would um, you know, get rid of IDs one and two because it was uh, empty. But now there's a keep empty argument. And so when you do it, it will keep them, but also mention that they're empty. So another improvement from tidy R. Uh, any questions about those? Okay. 
Ooh, I know so many, so many changes. Yes, <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> Um, I'm gonna see if my visual. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> cool. So let's talk about ggplot. Um, so new version of ggplot 3.4.0. Uh, and one of the changes is there's a new aesthetic called linguist. And essentially, whenever um, it will take over sizing for the width of lines. Previously, that was done with the aesthetic called size. Um, but as you will see, like there was some uh, some questions about that. So loading that. I tried to like, um, there's a way that you can use different versions of packages within the same document, but it just takes a little while to, to load. So I'm just going to show you like the image on the website, um, if that's all right. So essentially before it, when you wanted to change the width of lines, you would specify um, size, so scale size, and then you'd give it a range like so. And the issue is like for line widths, it's, it's length, right? Um, versus it was also the same aesthetic that you could use for uh, changing the size of points. And that one is area. And so like, there's just like a little bit of discrepancy as to like what exactly size did. And so um, now it's been replaced for these sorts of um, aesthetics by line width. And so now you can see instead of size, you're going to use scale line width. Uh, they look very similar, but I feel like putting them side by side like this, you could kind of see that there's a little bit of a difference. So it will change your plots if you've used size for line width before. Um, I think the gradient, you know, for final with, with line width and um, just a note, if you try to use size with uh, lines now, you're just going to get a deprecation warning and it's going to be very explicit. Just please use line width. And so something like point range, if you've used it before, is a mix of lines and circles. Um, and so it's going to be uh, it, like if it's if size is meant to be used for that aesthetic or for that um, for that aesthetic, like then it's not going to give you an error. It's only going to give you one if it doesn't make sense. And a really quick note is that for SF uh, plots, the default is now a little bit thinner, so it looks quite nice. Um, and that's just another thing. Like if you rerun old things um, with a new version of ggplot and it looks different. <laughs> and I have another ggplot, error messages. So uh, generally, again, uh, another example, there's better error messages in ggplot now with the newer version. And so say here, you're going to run this, and I do this many, many times. You run this, it's going to throw an error. And the reason is because I used a pipe instead of a plus sign. <laughs> so if you've ever been like me and done that, that, it's just going to be really informative as to what exactly um, what went wrong. It also tells you uh, when it went wrong. So it's, uh, here it says it must be done by AES. So I know it's an issue here and, um, and what to do about it. So use a plus sign instead of a pipe. And uh, here's just like another example that where it just shows you kind of like explicitly what it happened. So if you take a look at this, maybe you can anticipate what the error can be. We're running it. Here we go. The stack count is, can only have an X or a Y, and it'll let you know it happened in the first layer. So I know, you know, I'm looking at here to to fix the problem. So better error messages in ggplot. Any questions about ggplot? Uh, I didn't see any questions in the. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Cool. 
Okay, let's talk about PER. So PER is a package for functional programming, which is uh, working with functions in R. Um, it is uh, like incredibly helpful, especially if you're doing things, you know, across files, across tables, working with lists. Um, and so, yeah, very, very handy function. And you can probably guess it also has a new update 1.1.0 um, where, oh, it should be 1.0.0, I believe. Sorry. Um, where there's a lot of like big new changes. So PER is seven years old. And so this is the first major release as in it's 1.0.0, which is very, very exciting um, because it's a major release. It's kind of like the chance that the Tidyverse team had to go through, you know, really think about the fundamentals of what PER is as a package, uh, implement the functions that they believe should be part of her and, you know, and then release it. So that's why you uh, will we'll see, like, there have been a lot of changes um, that come with a major release. So first up is uh, in mapping. So there is, oh, I feel bad. I'm going to restart my session. I know it takes a while, but I think it's worth it. <laughs> loading for all right so first thing is progress bars uh this is very exciting so if you ever run a long um running job in per and you're like is this uh even close to being over now you do not have to wonder by adding progress equals true uh it will let you know what it, what exactly um how far it has been so made myself a note to open the console so here it's going to map through this function. Ta -da. So neat. <laughs> it gives you an ETA and everything. And say, you know, you're doing multiple things or you just want to make sure that you name things and understand what exactly is going on. You could give it an identifier like so. And so here you can see what the identifier is. Just put waiting. Uh, so that's uh, per progress bars. One more time, just better errors that will let you know what um, exactly caused the problem. So here we have a list. We have a uh, 10, 5, and then a character of, of, of A and X. And so then we're going to map over all of these elements saying, please divide by two. So as you can imagine, it's going to hit an error. And if you know this was more complex, you might be wondering what exactly happened. And it will tell you where. So in index three, that's where um, the error happened and what exactly happened. The non-numeric argument, you know, I try to divide a character by two. And so a uh, final uh, addition in, on this document for per, there's a new map vec uh, function. So what the map family does is it applies a function to every element of a list. And um, then you also specify like kind of what you want back. So map always returns a list. You know, map int would inter uh, return an integer, map double, map character, et cetera. So in this case, uh, Alluding back to the earlier one, we're going to divide each of these elements by two. So we get in a list 0.5, 1, and 1.5. And so now there's a general map vec. Uh, so here you have to kind of know like what exactly you wanted the output to be. And um, you know, and then like say you you mapped when you wanted to map character, then you have to go back and fix it. So map vec is a more generalized and you can work with other sorts of things like dates, for example. So here we're going to apply this function to one, two, one, two, and three. And we're going to use map back to get back a date. So as opposed to say map, which would return us a, a list here, map fact gives us back what we gave it, which was a date. 
Um, but a thing to note, if you try to combine different things, again, like character and number, um, it's just going to throw an error because you can't combine the two. So that's per. Um, I just have a quick question about if you yeah. go back um, where you were. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, not very practical with this function, but uh, I need to put the slash. Is that a requirement for the function to? Uh, I'm sorry. Could you repeat that? So you say it, it this um. Uh, so here that's it's one two three and then map back. Uh, yes. Yeah, I need to 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 do this back. Slash. Oh, yes. Um, so the backslash in this. Um, so that is the, uh, I, I believe since R4.2, um, a way that you can write functions in R. And it's just a shorthand, really, for like that. Um, so instead of having to write out function, you could do a, a slash. Um, and then here is like, you know, what you put within your function, and then next to it is the function itself. And uh, in the in the per blog post, um, I do recommend reading it. I mean, I recommend reading all of them, but that one in particular kind of goes through like um, a bit more on the base R and how to use it now with um, with per. Uh, I, I think like. You know, for the most part, with dplyr or with tidyr, we've seen we didn't really need to think too much about how to create these what they're called an anonymous functions. Um, but um, with per, it happens a lot, and so we're going to see, like, you know, that you have the option to do it um, the previous way. But I, I think the hope is like um, to get a bit comfortable with creating these functions in base R. Um, to be able to use them within per, uh, as opposed to, you know, kind of um, the previous way of doing it before there was um, this functionality in base R. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And, and um, again, not to like, a <laughs> yeah, keep, keep, um, my own horn, but please like uh, take a look at the blog post that I wrote with my brother. I, I think like it, I, we tried really hard to kind of break down the different steps of creating this in in base R because it is very new and and it looks very different. <laughs> yeah, Ricardo says uh, reminds me of Python lambda function. Yes, that's exactly what it is. Yep. <laughs> um, Yep, so now base R just has like that functionality as well. Yep, exactly. Cool. Um, so I know for, we just have a few documents left and then we can open up to more general questions. Um, there are two functions from per called keep and discard. They keep and discard elements by value. So here, you know, we want to create um, 10 tens. And then we uh, say like for, for each one, like create a sample of um, five. And then we just want to keep the ones that uh, have a average greater than six. And here, here that anonymous function is showing up again. See? So you could do it either way, this or that. And um, so here we have two results of, of um, vectors that, where the mean is greater to, than six, which is all we wanted to keep um, from, this, uh, from this simulation, I guess. And similarly with discard, you know, we want to remove all the results that we have with a mean greater than six. So, um, but if you notice that's by value, we have to say like the value is greater than six or, or whatnot. 
So now there's a new one that lets you do it by position as opposed to by value. So say we have this list and we want to keep A, B, and C. Um, we use this new function keep at in order to keep it by, um, by, uh, by the name as opposed to having to specify what exactly the value is. And similarly, um, one for discard. Yeah. And um, sorry. And then one last thing is you can also provide it a, a vector, or sorry, a logical vector in keep at and discard at instead of um, having to give it the names of, of the thing that you want to keep. Any questions? Cool. Okay. Per. Uh, so two new things are flattening and simplification. And so uh, list flatten, this is incredibly helpful. It's just a way to flatten lists hierarchy by hard hierarchy. So in this case, we have uh, one list um, in the second uh, um, element, like it has another list, the third one has another list, and then it, it kind of branches out from there. So you can see it's a deeply hierarchical um, list here. So say we want to remove one of the layers, we could use list flatten ones, and that removes one of the layers. And so uh, everything kind of shifts over one, um, and so the number of lists actually changes because this is like list within a list and then another list. And so that's why it's list of two. And now it's a list and then three other lists, which is a list of four. Um, but it, especially if you work with lists, it's, it's very helpful to be able to kind of move hierarchies depending on what you need. If you would do it again, you know, uh, it'll keep going until there's no more, uh, there are no more lists and then it'll just stay you know in one hierarchy like so like it won't um, make the list disappear and finally there's a list simplify which um, produces a simpler type of the thing that you give it so here's a list oh i didn't print x but the type of x is a list Say we want to simplify it, we just want these elements in a character vector. We could use list simplify, run it again. Now we have a character vector, which is great. Um, there are a few rules. It'll only succeed if every element has a length one. So here we have three and four within this list, so it's not going to work. Um, everything must be compatible. So we have a character with two numbers, so that's not going to work. And if um, if you want it so that like simplify if possible, but if you can't simplify, just don't throw an error. You can add strict equals false. And then you can also be specific as to what exactly you want the, the output to be. Oh, and one more note, um, a deprecation. So map. DFR and map DFC have been de and superseded. I'm sorry, not deprecation superseded. And instead, they suggest that you use list R bind and list C bind. So, whereas before you may have used this in the past, this is another one of that map family of functions. Um, they're suggesting that first you use map, created a list, and then use list R bind to create what it is that you need. Okay, uh, any questions? Thank you. So um, there, there is one from Dorota. Hi, Dorota. Can you, is, she said, can you control which list is removed? Uh, in the hierarchy? Oh. Okay. Let me try and open it up again. Yeah, I believe it does it by hierarchy, the specific function. Um, I can double check, like, so it will just move things over. 
Um, yeah. I think there are other functions if you want to be more specific. So does it remove sort of from the inner to the outer list? Is that the idea? Um, I guess I'm just, I just want to clarify. Uh, yeah, Don't yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, 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 for sure. Okay, so let's walk through this uh, example. So here we have list one. And so I think this is one list. And then here we have another list um, that has Oh, I think you're muted. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know where I muted myself. Apologies. Um, I was going to say let's let's walk through this example. Um, so I think it does it like um from the outside in, if, if I had that, trying to conceptualize it. Like, so first we have one, which is its own list here. And then we have the second list, which is a list made up of two and another list and then made up of five. So that's represented here. And so when you use list flatten, what that does is uh, not, the first list, this one stays the same because it, it has nowhere to go. Like it, there's nothing to flatten. Um, but this one now uh, becomes a list of three because the two has become flattened into its own list. This one has, um, you know, but it's, this one stays a list of two, um, but now it's not within here. <laughs> And then this one becomes uh, its own list okay. too. Yeah. Okay. So, I see what so, happened. Yeah. So if you see it here, um, I uh, like I had to print this out a bunch of times to be like, what exactly happened? <laughs> so, um, and so then if you do it one more time, now all of these, once they, well, this list, this list, and this list again cannot be flattened anymore. Um, and then this one with its two children become flattened. Oop. I'm sorry. Here we go. These two with with uh, this list with these two children flattens and now they're all in the same hierarchy. Oh, so, thank you, appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, of course. It kind of reminds me of Excel, you know, like that, yeah. <laughs> where you're like back, 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 and you make the numbers smaller. <laughs> cool. And then finally, just some breaking changes. Um, uh, so as you have seen, map DFR and map DFC have been um, superseded. And then there are also some breaking changes that you should just be aware of in PER. If, if these are um, uh, functions that you have used in the past. So uh, the Tidyverse team did a lot of uh, research and made sure that you know these are things that you know everything has alternatives, everything has been um, you know, communicated with, with folks that they knew were using these within their packages. Um, but if this is something that's common in your data workflow, again, it's just something to um, to keep in mind so that your code doesn't break. Uh, so let me load her. And so uh, one thing is that now pluck, which is a function that lets you get an element within these kind of nested structures that we were just talking about. So it has a default setting. And now when you have um, something in your default, it will only return the default for null and absent elements. So here we have a list where y um, a is a character, like an empty character. And then uh, here we have null um, for y b. And so here you might expect if you pluck A from Y and set the default as an A because it's an empty character that you would get an A, but now um, per will give you back your empty character. So that's again, um, something new to, to keep a, uh, in mind versus if you pull this null um, value out from B, it will be replaced by the default. And if you do something that doesn't exist, like C, it will also give you the default. So that's one breaking change. Um, it impacts map because uh, map uh, uses 
uh, pluck it when given an integer vector, character vector, or list. So just, again, another thing to be aware of. As part of the vectors package, it's going to be more explicit in, in the things that it wants and then give you like better errors. So before, you might have uh, been able to get away with using map character with numbers. But as you can see, it's really not ideal. Like um, you're getting these character values out, but they have a bunch of zeros and probably not what exactly you want. Uh, now it's going to um, ask you, like now it's going to give you a warning and be, be like, please be explicit. <laughs> and what does explicit mean? It means like saying like, yeah, I do want a character um, for map character like so. So that's also like kind of assuming that that's generally what you were expecting instead of this. Uh, another thing just to note is um, there are different ways that R deals with nulls. And now um, previously, like it would depend how you wrote what you wanted to do which result you would get, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, so here, you know, we want to set A to null. So we can assign it with this dollar sign. And when we look at it, now A is no longer in part of this list. And then, uh, but we could also do it oops, this way with the brackets and say X2 A, make that null. And then when you look at that, it is different. It, a still exists, but it's a null. So um, like you could imagine a world where you expect them to do the same thing, but they actually do different things just because of how base R works with brackets and dollar signs and things like that. Um, now in per, there's a, uh, um, a consistent way when you use uh, list modified to change something into a null, it's going to be the same no matter how you do it. And if you want to um, remove it, like that first example that we showed, you use this element, uh, this function called zap. Oops. Think so. And finally, some deprecations. And so uh, if you've ever used cross, all of that has been deprecated in favor of TidyR's expand grid. So an example of why <laughs> is one I found in the GitHub discussions. So here we have some letters. Uh, cr what cross does is it pr provides all of the um, combinations of you know the things that you give it. And so uh, check this out. <laughs> um, so running uh, cross df on uh, X up above. We're just going to wait here a little bit. This is where the, the progress bar comes in handy. <laughs> so that took 39 seconds. Um, and then using expand grid to do the same thing. That took uh, point zero, zero, three. So that is why cross has been deprecated. Um, and you um, can check out the documentation for examples of how to like uh, translate your code if, if you'd like to do so. And then at the bottom here, and again, more. Um, in more detail in the in the tidy blog uh, tidyverse blogs blog posts are just uh, various things that have been superseded and deprecated um, for various reasons like splice and lift and prefend you know when and this was just part of that effort of finding you know what is the core of part per um, what they were hoping to do with a with a major release and that is what I have <laughs> thanks all.